Welcome to the Life in the Red podcast presented by the Lincoln Journal Star, your source for Husker news, analysis, and more. From football in the fall to recruiting in the summer, we've got you covered. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Bassnett, Parker Gabriel, and Stephen M. Sippel. Three, two, one. Welcome in, Life in the Red podcast. There's Sip, there's me, there's Parker. It is 4.14 p.m. here on Friday, February 4th, a little late afternoon podcast recording to take you into the, the weekend. Happy Hour uh, we podcast. Got a, the Happy Hour podcast here on Life in the Red, here on HuskerExtra.com. We're going to talk some football. Uh, we had signing day earlier this week. We'll, we'll dive into that and what the guys heard from Scott Frost earlier in the week. We got the, some hoops talk to get to, Nebraska entering the back half of their conference schedule and kind of what that means, what that looks like going forward. So we'll get right into it. Uh, signing day was Wednesday. Nebraska picked up the commitments of two more players, two skill position guys, A.J. Allen, running back, originally committed to TCU, followed um, – I'll call him Major Applewhite, Brian Applewhite, uh, up to cool. up to Lincoln. Cool. Uh, Janiron Bonner, wide receiver, also making his way to Lincoln. So kind of a la- couple last-minute, uh, I guess, cherries on top of the recruiting class for Nebraska pending whatever happens in the transfer portal over the next few months. So – Ross, you talked about that. I'll let you guys kind of take it over. You've been on it from the start, and I, and I guess just your thoughts on what they did on signing day. Go ahead, P. Yeah, nobody was really on Janiron Bonner. That's one takeaway from the week. It was amazing. Like, not very often this, in this day and age do recruits, like, get by everybody, basically. Um, and Janiron Bonner got to the day before signing day before there was any reporting about the connection between him and Nebraska. And then the next day he picked Nebraska and signed with them. And as it turned out, he'd been to Lincoln on an official visit um, the weekend previous and Frost and Mickey Joseph had been at Atlanta to see him uh, on Wednesday preceding the official visit over the weekend. Um, And they kept it quiet. I think probably because um, he was widely considered uh, one of the best, if not the best, remaining wide receiver in the country that was still available uh, in January. And they didn't want anybody, they didn't want anybody else to get any help knowing that he was looking around and available. So they managed to keep it under wraps basically until Tuesday morning, I think. And he picked Nebraska had interest from a bunch of other schools, um, but what had been committed to Georgia tech from April, basically um, into January. And then yeah, AJ Allen, uh, running back from Monroe, Louisiana, like you said, Baz, uh, was committed to play for Brian Applewhite at TCU uh, and flipped to Nebraska. Still could have gone there. Uh, talked to some people who thought that in some years, um, you know, he he would he would be an LSU type of guy or or a SEC type of guy. And just the way that you know the way it went this year, Applewhite had a good relationship with him, and Nebraska was able to get in on him. So. It's interesting, um, Sipple, just the way that Nebraska stocked up on offensive skill position players, you know, two more on signing day. And, uh, you know, they've got eight. If you just look at receivers and running backs alone, they've got eight guys in this class between transfers and high school players. Yeah, they loaded up. Um, it looks like they got what, what well, they have seven scholarship running backs. Yeah, right now. Right. Yeah. Yep. Total, which is a little heavy. Um and that might work itself out a little bit in the spring or before the spring. Maybe not. I mean, you can carry seven. Um, the receiver group, yeah. I, well, what I've been saying is this. When Nebraska lines up in Dublin, if that game goes off, which I expect it will, um, I, there's just going to be a lot of skill players out there that weren't out there last year. Yeah. yeah. Trey Palmer, uh, Isaiah Garcia Castaneda. They'll be in the rotation. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if a freshman ends up in there, the coldest Crawford or Victor Jones. Victor Jones probably has a better chance because he's he, he'll be here for yep. spring. Yep. Um, he's got a you know he's a bigger receiver. Um, I okay. I mean, if you just want to continue in that vein, Thomas Fedoni would be a new face. He'll be he'll be out there. He played a little bit last year. Vokalex out. Travis Vokalex out during the spring. Um, which Frost revealed on Wednesday. So 
you'll see Fedoni in the spring. You also see him in the fall. And then at running yeah. back, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know who your starter is. Ramirez Johnson's a leading returning rusher, and I like him. But they, I mean, they brought in some guys, and and I think Anthony Grant is the guy you'd look at first. The transfer from from what is it, New Mexico Military Institute? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Roswell and Roswell, New Mexico, big numbers for the best junior college team in the country. And he's 5'11", 200 plus. So, uh, yeah, they you could see a whole bunch of new dudes out there. It's sort of amazing. And then, and then a, re, and a revamped offensive line, too. Yeah. And oh, by the way, a new quarterback as well. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Beth. Yeah, by the way, yeah. Casey Thompson, how, how could we forget? Yeah. Well, that's the narrative, at least. Well, that's the narrative that it will be. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Yeah. It might there's a, there's some people that aren't big into narratives out there. Yeah. Is that Rossi your narrative like, or is that yeah. your narrative? Or Rossi that doesn't Rossi? like all the narratives that are out there. Um, but I think they brought him in at, to start. And uh, maybe maybe Logan Smothers or Chubba Purdy or Heinrich Harburg can beat him out. I wouldn't expect it, but you never know. So, yeah, I mean, that's – I mean, yeah, I think it's sort of amazing that – they could roll into the 2022 season with new quarterback, new starting running back, a couple new receivers, uh, new tight end, new new look offensive line. Like it's just gonna, like you say, it's gonna be a lot different. The thing I'm I'm really interested in with the running back position in particular is the way that Scott on Wednesday talked about AJ Allen. He was really complimentary of him. He said, you know, there's a lot of running backs that can do some things. He's a guy that looks like he can do everything we want a running back to do. And he described both Allen and Janiron Bonner as guys who, as soon as you put on their tape, um, they jump out at you. And, you know, he, he, what he said about AJ Allen was he didn't know anything about him until he interviewed Brian Applewhite for the job, which is interesting because Nebraska offered AJ Allen a scholarship about a week before Applewhite's hire was finalized and announced. So the timeline tracks. Um, they interviewed yep. him and, and Brian Applewhite said, yeah, I've, I've had this guy committed to TCU. You know, I could probably get him if you hire me or, or what, however that conversation goes. Frost said he put on the tape and A.J. Allen was one of his favorite running backs in the country that he watched the entire year. And that's an, that's an easy thing for a coach to say after you sign a guy. Um, but I mean, when you watch just the highlights that are on huddle or whatever from, from AJ Allen and Monroe, and when you consider the level of competition he's playing against down there and all that, like he's pretty darn impressive. Uh, I put him in my super six as a late addition. Um, the caveat to that is that he and Emmett Johnson won't be in spring ball. So you've got seven running backs total. Five of them will be in spring ball. You don't know if Gabe Urban's going to be fully healthy. Uh, I'm out of that group of five. So, and then however it goes in spring ball, whether all five of those guys come through and feel good about where they are, or if somebody leaves or whatever, then you add AJ Allen and Emmett Johnson to the mix going into the summer as freshmen. Um, it's just going to be a very interesting group from now all the way through till, you know, the season starts really. I, um, I would say this. If you're a running backs coach and you're looking to move up in the world and you have a guy like AJ Allen that you're recruiting and you can go to a coach and say, you know, if you hire me, I got this guy. Um, there's no doubt there. I know there's no doubt that that helped Applewhite. Um, Cause I was told that if, you know, when they were looking at guys, yeah, if, if they can show us a guy, if they can show us a guy they're recruiting that, that, that they could bring here, that, that helps his picture a lot. Um, and I bet that helped Brian Applewhite quite a bit, especially with the timeline you laid out. Yeah. So now not that like, Applewhite wouldn't have got the job, not that Applewhite wouldn't have got the job anyway, but it enhances his portfolio. So to speak. yes, it certainly helps. Yeah. So now you've got seven scholarship running backs and 14 scholarship receivers and wow. five scholarship quarterbacks, you know, it's going to be, there's a lot to uh, sort through here uh, over the month of March for Nebraska. It's a lot of scholarships. And do they have anybody that can block? Do they have anybody who can block? Is the they have zero scholarship <laughs> offensive linemen. None. Not it's a, a single huge one. issue. It's a huge issue. I don't think that was a cheap shot. I mean, Nebraska's offensive line struggled, and they got to get better up there. And, they, you know, yeah, let's face it. Let's face it. 
they did a good job. I mean, Frost did a good job with this hiring the staff and, and got some good, good players out of the portal, put together a good class. But it, it's a little light up front on both sides. I mean, it has to, you, ha- that, you have to say it. And they're looking, yeah. they're, lo- they're looking to add, um, as is everybody um, in the free world. Um, they're look, they're looking for offensive linemen, a defensive linemen, and a pass rusher. And they, you know what? You better I hope they have some inroads because they need it. They need it. Yeah. Okay. Simple. This is not, I mean, the, the they don't need to know the answer to this question on February 4th at 4:24 p.m. But I'm gonna ask it to you just to illustrate what's going on at the position group right now. If I were to ask you to put together right now, like who would Nebraska start? Who would be the starting five on the offensive line? Like, where would you even begin that conversation? Ah, that's well, you have to begin the conversation with two of the critical players. You don't know what their availability. Well, one of them, Turner Corcoran, you know what his availability will be like this spring. He won't be available. Right. Um, Turner Corcoran has a shoulder issue apparently. Um, and will miss the spring, according to Frost. I don't know. I mean, what what what, what do you think Pro, Teddy Prohaska's availability will be? I mean, he, he, those guys. Frost said those guys will be around and they'll be able to learn and be in meetings and stuff. But I don't think. I mean, Prohaska's working out with the team now, and I think Corcoran probably is to like some degree. He's around at least, but like, I don't think they're gonna push Prohaska to like real far physically. In spring ball, why would you? Like, why would you with a guy that young and that big and that important to what you're doing in the future? Right. I, now, I, I get it. I understand what you're saying. But, okay, you took Corcoran out of August. Um, be, yeah. I mean, because of a lower, you know, a leg injury. Now he has an upper body injury and he's going to miss spring. There's That's critical developmental time. Yeah. Those guys need development. Um, I know that you got to hold Prohaska out. He's, he's still in a, these guys are young guys that are, this is, this is key developmental time that they're missing, oh, yeah. but those, that's where you start. I mean, those are two best guys. So besides that, um, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I just don't know what to say, yeah. to say about left tackle right now, as it stands, a left. Where does, where does Nordy about, Newelli fit into that? Where does, yeah, he fits in. I'd say Newelli fits at left guard. Yeah, where does um, where does Bryce Bennett fit? Does he fit? You know, where does right? Oh, yeah, you got the new guys, Kevin Williams and Hunter Anthony, the two transfers. Yeah. Are they guards or tackles? Like this is all. If you're Donnie Rayola, as they call him, you could look at this two ways. You could look at it like, man, I'm walking into a mess here. Like, or you could look at it as like you got a whole room of a lot of young guys and and some talent, and then you can pretty much do whatever you want at this point with. You know, there's nobody, there's not many guys except for Prohaska, I guess, if he was healthy, but he's a true freshman who's, who played in five games, a couple of them, one or, one or two snaps only. Like, nobody in that room can say to you, well, coach, I really have been, I'm the right tackle or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, he's got, he's got mm-hmm. pretty much full license to reimagine that room how he wants to. Now, that's a heck of a challenge. I'm not saying that's unilaterally a good thing, but it just is going to be interesting to see what he, how he sees that room and how he sees guys in terms of what position, um, like what is Ethan Piper? What is New Ely? You know, what is Kevin Williams Jr.? Like all of these guys um, have played different positions over the course of their careers so far. And it's going to be interesting to see how they go about sort of be just beginning the process of sorting out who goes where. Yeah. I mean, we don't, you know, we haven't, we don't know who the center will be. I mean, they they lost Cam Jurgens. I can't tell you right now who that will be. There was some talk about legitimate talk about Turner Corcoran taking over the center spot. Now I wouldn't, I wouldn't even think about that right now. I mean, I I just don't even know how that could be in the conversation. If he's going to, he's going to miss spring. So is that, is that Ethan Piper? There's Hicks in his back. It could be Hicks and, um, I'd say those two guys are the lead candidates. I, you could play Noeli at center too, but I would start if I would rail with that position right there. You got to figure out, you got to figure out the center. And it's, I feel a little uncomfortable talking about Teddy Prohaska as he's, as if he's the, the glue. I mean, right. he's, yeah. he's a, yeah. a freshman. 
who's played five games. I mean, yeah, but that's yeah, kind two of, of them. He was at. just like a jumbo tight end. Yeah, he's like a tight end for yeah. two of them. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, so it's a little strange talking about a guy like that in those terms. So yeah, Rayola's got a big job. I mean, come on, all those skill guys. It doesn't make all that much difference. Um, what kind of skill guys you have, obviously, if you can't block. So Rayola's got the see biggest guys. job on the team this spring. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Like it's the most, it's the most. I think you're it's right. Stress. It's got the most attached to it. Like you said, Sip. Doesn't matter yeah. how good those skill guys yeah. are if nobody can block for them. Hey, Bez, Bez, that sounds like a column. It does. It, it maybe that's Monday. I, I'll tell you what. It it really was pronounced during the postseason. I thought what the trenches mean. I mean, if you watched, you know, Michigan bulldoze Ohio State in the game, it was really pronounced what was happening up front. Michigan just plowed them. And then when, if you go to the college football championship games at final four, it was, that's what it, that's what it was about. Cincinnati too small up front to stop Alabama's running game. Georgia just too, I mean, just overwhelmed Michigan in the trenches. And I, I was thinking the whole time, I hope Frost is watching this because it, it drives home the notion that even at, even at those, those very best teams in the country where they're winning is up front. Um, so I, no, I just think I just I guess what I'm telling you is Nebraska has a long way to go, long way to go. Maybe not as much at the skill positions as as in those those trench positions. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be fascinating to watch. Well, should we talk? Uh, we just talked a lot of stuff. We should probably talk the quarterback uh, situation uh, now that that's kind of all sorted out. Frost talked about it some. We kind of we kind of touched on it already a little bit with the with the narratives and the things like that. But Casey Thompson, Chubba Purdy, Henry Carbert, Logan Smothers, all competing for that starting job. And uh, Frost made it pretty clear in his, his press conference. They they told the guys they brought in they were planning on bringing in more than one transfer quarterback. They're gonna let him battle it out. I guess I'll, I'll ask I'll ask you Parker what'd you what'd you make of those comments and kind of what Scott what Scott said the other day. Yeah, and it's interesting because Charles Thompson, um, I think, told Sipple roughly the same, or maybe it was Casey in the NIL interview that he did. Where, you know, Nebraska made it clear from the outset that that they were going to take two, and I think they talked with um, both Casey Thompson and Chubba Purdy about that in the recruiting process. Um, and it just sets up a fascinating sort of uh, – the way I've described it is it's sort of a cascading series of – decisions um like one is the first one is does Casey Thompson like a lot of people expect win the job and then if he does then the second question is how does the pecking order shake out behind him because you're not not only is it like who goes in the game if his helmet pops off but you're looking at it to some degree as like who's putting themselves in pole position for the post Casey Thompson era whenever that is, you know, if it's one year or two years or whatever. So then you got that. And then three, once that pecking order, at least initially is sort of set, or you have an idea of who the the next guy and the next guy behind Casey Thompson in this scenario are, then what happens to the guys that aren't in that group? I mean, it's one thing if Richard Torres, who's just been on campus for three weeks, true freshman, coming off a knee injury that ended his senior year, like, okay, if he ends up number five, like, yeah, you'd sort of expect that at this point, just because he's been hurt and he's just getting to college and, you know, not quite as extreme as Heinrich Harburg, but he didn't play against great competition at San Antonio Southside, sort of an under, you know, recruited part of Texas. And so if he's at the back of the pack, yeah, I mean, you might sort of expect that, but what if it's not him, you know? What if it's um, Smothers or what if it's Purdy, you know, uh, or Harburg for that matter? So all of that, you know, not only does Nebraska hope probably, you know, if you could give them the truth serum that Casey Thompson grabs the job and runs with it this spring. um, But you also have interesting decisions right away because of the numbers and the, the good numbers, strong numbers they have now at the position about what happens down ballot, so to speak. Yeah, what happens? I mean, there's a lot of things that go through your mind right now because they're changing the offense. They have to, I mean, the quarter, they have to communicate all that to the quarterbacks. 
can they do it all at one time? Is there more, is, do, do some quarterbacks get a little bit more time than others? I mean, I think with Whipple, I mean, how does Whipple do this? I mean, he's got to communicate the offense um, at every step to those guys first. Well, he's the quarterback's coach. So, so how, I mean, I guess they have quarterback meetings. I just like to see what that whole picture looks like right now. I'd love to be over there for the meetings to see who, who, I mean, I imagine Whipple's leading the meetings. How forceful is he? Who's, who's chiming in the most? What's the quarterback picture look like as it relates to all that? Um, I just, I keep saying this, it's got to feel like fourth down every day over there right now. I think, I mean, there's, it's, there's just so much to do. And Frost said that it's going to take a long time and it's got, it's a lot. Frost laid it out really well. It was interesting. Yeah. This is think about all the line calls for the different formations, the language change. I kind of try to marry the language of Whipple system with Nebraska's there's sign language to learn. Um, yeah, there's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot to think about. Yeah, that's that's called a segue, folks. And that's, I think, kind of the next thing we need to get to here is just the nature of the challenge. Spring ball starts in three weeks, roughly, give or take. Um, you got that. Then you scatter for the summer. And then then you're back to start working out beginning of August. So is it beginning of August, Parker, or is it in July with the early? It'll be since they play on December or on uh, December, yeah. Uh, August 27th, they'll start camp late July. There you go. So, yeah, I mean, not a lot of time, like like, like you guys were just talking about. And that's – besides everything else, besides figuring out your whole line and who's going to start and who's going to play where, it's it's the challenge of putting this all together. And Scott kind of talked about that as well, just the – you know, having the meetings and, and kind of maybe hinting that it's – it's gonna, well, it's obviously going to take some time and learning a new language and all that. And that's – that's kind of the underlying theme to all this is, is Nebraska's got a real challenge on its hands to, on its hands to figure this out and not a lot of time to, to get it done. Yeah. Um, you, you, you alluded to truth serum. I imagine if you gave truth serum to frost, he'd, he might tell you uh, this whole Dublin. I mean, with, with all due respect to the Dublin convention and visitors bureau, um, I don't know that this is the perfect time to take your team to Dublin. Um, uh, you know, with everything going on, I guess it could be fun and all that, but um, week zero, I don't know. Um, I, I think you'd prefer to play sort of a lightweight on the first week of September. That's, that's what I'd say. Am I yeah. wrong? No, no, nope. not at all. I'm, I don't like, I don't like to rain on the big Dublin parade. I mean, I guess it'll be fun, but uh, <laughs> yeah. that, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. You'd rather you'd probably rather play Dakota. Western Carolina than play Northwestern <laughs> across the pond. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The yeah, I know. Players. It is interesting. One of the things that's that I just we won't really know except for maybe over the summer and, and when camp starts, depending on how much guys are willing to share. And it, there's a lot of new guys too, so that's part of it. But I just I wonder for a guy like um, for Logan Smothers or for Ramir Johnson or Xavier Betts. Like what, I wonder how much different it's going to be. You know, one of the things that Frost said in December and, and he sort of reiterated, I, I thought it was interesting. He didn't make a big point of making this distinction on Wednesday, but he did make it. He said the coaches have a lot of work to do. The coaches have a lot of work to do to marry the language and all that. And then what he said was, and the players will have some new things to learn too. And so like what, what part of what they're trying to do is take all of these new ideas this is the way I understood it. And, and Mark Whipple sort of made mention of this in December. Some things are going to be called what Mark Whipple's only always called them. But I think that Frost's ideal here is that they're going to take all of these new ideas and tr- as best they can, like translate them into the language that the, the Nebraska players already speak for lack of a better term. Like if something was called this, and it's related to that, then let's put it in that family of what the calls have always been. Um, That's not going to be perfect. Obviously there's going to be new stuff for the guys to learn. There's going to be some new concepts and and all of that, probably particularly in the passing game um, in terms of, you know, Mark Whipple's influence, but man, I mean, you don't, it gets trickier 
if you're sending not only the coaches back to the drawing board, but the kids entirely back to the drawing board too, to try to learn an entire new language over the off season. So the more they can keep that stuff streamlined, I mean, it's not going to be, it's not going to be fully streamlined, but the closer you can keep it to sort of like the universe that those guys have lived in, um, the better, as long as you're actually getting implemented what you want to. Good point. I'll tell you. What comes to mind is this. If <laughs> I mean, I don't like to do this where you tell coaches how to do their jobs since I've never Go for it. coached a team or Please ran do, even, a, even a Casey's mini mart, whatever. But I think what you'd come out of right now, you come out of February, going into February 28th, start a spring ball with the, with the idea that we have to make this as easy as humanly possible for the players. Yeah. I mean, just – will I think that the the coaches have to really shoulder the load and and try to make it as streamlined as possible not 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 make it not junk it up too much and and know what the hell you're going to do which I've heard all the all already that Whipple is good that way that this is the what we're going to do what I keep what I would say is you can't have a lot of meetings where you go out of it going all right, we didn't really get anything done on that. We'll get to that next week. Now, I don't. There's not a lot of time to to mess around. I mean, you got to in Whipple. What what I've heard is he's a lot like McBride, Charlie McBride. Where this is this is no, this is the way we're going to do it. We're going to do it. This is this is how we're going to do it. We're going to decide this today. We've got it. Now we'll go forward. There's got to be a lot of that, and not a lot of mealy mouthing around. And, there's okay yeah. well well how about we figure this out the first week of spring eh, good Can't luck i mean yeah it, 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 i think the product if you do a lot of that then the first week of september you'll notice it pretty profoundly i think this is a this is a tangent this is like a tangible thing that you can point to about why casey thompson may have an advantage in the quarterback race too yeah because he's a fifth year guy i mean he's 23 years old and what the, the book on Whipple has been that he's, he's really demanding of his quarterbacks. And I think when you combine that with what we've heard, I mean, the thing about Frost's offense, it was supposed to be like when he first got hired here, the deal on it was it was supposed to be player friendly, right? Quarterback friendly. It's really easy for quarterbacks to play in. It's really easy for playmakers to play in. And then as we went along, it was like every – you know, at running back is like, well, it's hard for young guys to play. And Matt Lubick said a lot of times, it's just hard for young receivers to play in this offense. Like, why? Why, why is that? Yeah. Why is it so hard to get young guys on the field at those positions? And so the more that under Mark Whipple, the faster Casey Thompson and that group, but in Thompson in particular, the faster they start to get it down and the faster that they can orchestrate it, the easier it is for everybody else. You know, the more, you know, Mickey Joseph talked about not over coaching, coaching the athleticism out of receivers at LSU. Like the more they can just let those guys go out. And of course you have to comprehend it and understand it and all of that. But like, it just, I don't know. It's part of the reason why I think Casey Thompson's going to be hard to beat because he's been around the block. He's played in a couple different offenses. Um, you know, he's already, they all are, but you know, I just, I just tend to believe that he's got the best chance of getting this this stuff down quickly uh, to help a lot of other new players sort of get up to speed. As it's, we've touched on this before, but like how boring and vanilla is the spring game going to be when oh, we get to from like an offensive standpoint? Yeah, like we're not going to see anything for a couple reasons. One, they don't want to give anything away. Two, they probably won't know a whole lot yet. Like they probably won't have a whole lot installed yet. Like and so it's going to be very. Yeah, it's going to be very, very basic, very straightforward. And you know what? It's not the worst thing ever either. If you get really, really good at a few things early on and you can run them and run them with confidence, it's not so bad. That's 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 almost as good as having 100 different things you could do. Sort they, of should okay. just, they should just bring back Adrian and Austin Allen and run the other old <laughs> offense. Yeah, that's what they should do. <laughs> going to throw 15 Adrian. like pop passes to Austin Allen in the spring game. <laughs> Yeah, but you're right. Inside though. zone and four verticals. Yeah, the, the thing is, is so like the listeners and readers understand, Baz, you're right. It'll be vanilla. And and on along those lines, 
I my guess is we won't see much at all this spring, right? No, and I'm not saying that in any kind of uh, with any malice or anything. I mean, it, I, if I were the head coach, I wouldn't I wouldn't let the reporters see it either. Well, it's how many days is it going to look bad? Is the thing like how many that's, days are they going to practice? That's a good point. And the ball's all over the place, and guys are running into each other and whatever, and they're, they're not getting the yeah. signals or whatever. Like, there's going to yeah. be a lot of that. I mean, there just is. And that's, again, no knock on anybody, but. No, we've seen just, that before, Baz. We've seen it. When Callahan came here in 04, he let us, I mean, God bless him, he let us watch all of spring. We, we could watch every single practice, every minute of every single practice. I mean, it got to the point where I didn't even go. I was just, it was old. I mean, it, after about five of them, you're like, all right, I've seen enough practice for about three <laughs> years here. But um, the but it was a, it was very it, just what you said, Baz. At first, it was a sort of a nightmare. Like yeah. they they had a quarterback. I don't even want to name him because I, I respect him so much. Trying to run the West Coast offense that didn't fit it, and I always tell the story. It, we was, I was standing along the chain link fence in Memorial Stadium, and and DBs kept running back balls intercepted intercepted passes and i thought it was an interception drill i was like okay there this must be a drill right and the guy next to me was like no simple that's not a drill <laughs> i mean they're just <laughs> they're just taking back interceptions <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah it was it was a bad deal and that quarterback that year i think he threw 16 of them i mean it was it didn't it was a rough first year for bill but Baz, you're exactly right those first few practices were sort of like a disaster you know yeah yeah i mean that's just New part of the learning and and, and again I, there's there's value like there's value in being vanilla right like there's value and you how many co- how many times do you hear coaches say how many times do you hear this staff say it last year like we need to be really good at a few things we need to be really good at inside zone or whatever it is or we need to be really really good at this so we can go to it when we need to it there's value in that. Like there's value in, and having those basics down really, really good too. And so when you do get in the game, you can fall back on your training and your practice and all that stuff. So absolutely. Yeah. It's going to be, it's going to be vanilla. It's going to be ugly, but there's also going to be some value in that too, as you kind of learn that stuff as these guys go along. It's also not like they're going from it's, a, I mean, I, I don't, I can't sit here and tell you for sure exactly how extensive the makeover is going to be, but a lot of it's communication. I mean, it's not like they're going from the single wing to the, you know, fun and gun, you know, like that's, they're going to, you know, they're going to hang their hat on prop. They're going to try to do some of the same stuff in the run game. Maybe not quite so much quarterback stuff, but like, you know, that Frost, he's been consistent in what he wants to do in terms of the read stuff and, and inside zone and all all of, you know, so a lot of it's going to be, a lot of it's going to be like how much different is the way that Donovan Rayola teaches finding your landmark for a guard in the zone game compared to what Greg Austin did. And, yeah. and what changes does Brian Applewhite want to make to the running backs footwork and how he's, you know, processing what's in front of him in the run game compared to how held did it like that, that is that in the language stuff, like that's really what we're talking about. I mean, it's not going to be a full on, you know, everything's different left is right. And dark is, light and all of that but yeah it's going to be still there's a lot of work to do. there you go Good job. hoops Good job. Hard speaking of a lot of work speaking of a lot of work <laughs> let's talk about nebraska men's basketball um host northwestern tomorrow noon tip pinnacle bank arena kind of the second half of nebraska season after a brutal january they're of course 0 and 11 in the conference 6 and 16 overall coming off a a tough close loss at Michigan in a game, they played well enough to win uh, for the, for the most part and just, just lost the game at the end, you know, and that happens sometimes you just, you play well enough to win and you don't win, but it's, I'm writing about this for my game advance tomorrow. You know, tomorrow's game is kind of the start pending the the rescheduling of the Ohio state game. that got postponed, postponed earlier this year. They have eight games left in the season and seven of those games come against teams in the bottom half of the big 10 conference standings. Um, you look at Nebraska's schedule so far, they've played zero teams uh, in the bottom half of the conference standings to this point. Uh, they, they've played all the big guns so far. and Some games have been close, some games they have not. And I'm not saying 
that Nebraska's got a gimme left on the schedule or anything, or they're going to win tomorrow or anything like that. But tomorrow kind of starts this stretch from now until that season finale against Wisconsin, where you've got some games, you, you have a real legitimate chance at winning. Uh, and you get two of them right out of the gate at home in Northwestern at Minnesota. But this, this is kind of the chance for Nebraska to, to pull something out of this season. And look, they're not going to the NCAA tournament or anything like that. We know that, but they've got a chance to salvage something. And as simple as said before, they've got a chance to, for Fred Hoiberg to give Trev Albert something to think about uh, as, as the season goes on. Yeah. Kind of- yeah. Bass, you know what? And I, I know, you know, there's always that danger of damning somebody with faint praise. But one thing that you would say is they haven't unraveled. No, this team, it hasn't unraveled. It hasn't gotten weird. You haven't gotten guys leave. Um, you haven't, there's no, you, you don't see anything really untoward on the bench. Um, you know, you're not seeing, if there's infighting, Fred, I mean, one thing Fred, I think would be, is really good at is just his even keel. It kind of keeps like, I know, I know when stuff goes on, I've heard this about Fred, that he doesn't show day to day what you see on the bench and what you see Baz at your press conferences. That's Fred because he doesn't want to affect people around him where yeah. a guy like me will make everybody miserable uh, around well, him. Yeah. 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 Uh, no, we, Fred, no, we know. Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> We're well aware. <laughs> We're acutely aware of that. <laughs> You want to probe that any deeper, or do so you want to just? Yeah, you want to talk about that a little more. I got some feelings I'd like to get off my chest. Sip. <laughs> okay. No, I don't want to talk about it anymore. Okay, fine. Screw that. Um, Screw that. Fred, Fred, Fred will keep it to himself, so ever, lest everybody around him feels okay. You know. Look, that helps. I mean, that helps. It, it, it's. The, problem, the issue with that is when you're winning, you go, God, even killed coach. That's great. These guys don't get too up for anything. This, yeah. that, the other thing. When you're 0 11, yeah. Where's the fire? Why is he yeah, I know where you're going. Yeah. Rear end? Why is he throwing yeah. a chair? You know, I mean, it's, it, that's just the, the nature of the beast. But the only other way it doesn't help is if it, it, if, is if it's what precipitates players saying things like Kobe Webster said on a radio show where it's like, yeah. You can you, have, you can be even killed. That's fine, but you also have to be the where accountability in the program starts. Yeah, sometimes you do have to kick somebody in the butt or whatever. Whatever. Yeah. No, there, there's no doubt. But, but look, the fact of the matter is, Nebraska's got three of its next four at home. Three games they can win. The road games at Iowa, who hasn't exactly been lighting the world on fire, and then at Northwestern after that, and then a home game against Iowa, and then at Penn State where you won last year. You no, know, you don't look at any of those games and go, God, Nebraska's got no chance in, no. in any of those games, especially after how they played the other night, even how they played against Rutgers by and large. And we've talked about this before. Like, look at all the chances Nebraska gave itself in January to win games and, and was, you know, we don't have to recount them all here, but Michigan, of course, Rutgers, Ohio State, the first Indiana. And like they had these chances against teams that are NCAA tournament teams, top half of the Big Ten teams. And now uh, – the margin of error maybe increases ever so slightly when you're playing the Northwesterns and the Minnesotas and the Maryland's and the Iowa's not saying it's, it's, it gets a lot easier because nothing's Mm -hmm. easy. And, but Nebraska, if it continues to play like it has, like if it plays like it did against Michigan the other night, it's going to win some games. I mean, it just is. They, They played too good the other night to not win games if they played like that. So the margin for error It's bigger. The team, like you said, Sip, it it hasn't fractured. They play hard. And and Fred said today they come, they still show up to practice and want to work. And and all these, you know, that it seems to be in a decent spot considering where they're at record wise. So look, they've got a shot here. They've got a shot to to win some of these games down the stretch. We'll see what it looks like, of course. They it's none of them are easy. And and if they go out tomorrow, Northwestern beats them by 15, maybe that changes what, what it looks like over the next couple of weeks. Yep. They've got a shot to, 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 to salvage. Oh, yeah, Baz. Like people will tell you, people that maybe are a little more casual and following this team will say, you're crazy if you think they're going to win four or five. But if you're watching it closely, you're not. You're not crazy. I mean, it. I half expect it. And I don't feel weird saying it. Now, I've said it a lot. I will say this. I've been saying they're going to break through and it never happens. So people are like, yeah, right, simple. But I, I, I'm the schedule is – 
is it's markedly easier. And they're playing well enough to break through. Now, Northwestern will be tough. Um, they're disciplined. They're really well coached. I imagine it'll be a tight game. I, I love Nebraska against Minnesota because I don't think I don't know if Minnesota can come in here and generate enough offense to beat Nebraska. I love them. I love Nebraska against Minnesota. I, from there, I don't know. I'd have to look at it a little closer. But yeah, and you know, we got to mention Bryce McGowan's, who's you know, I mean, Andy Katz on the broadcast the other night against uh, Michigan was pushing pretty hard for him. Was it Michigan or was it the game? No, it was the Rutgers game. I'm sorry. It was the Rutgers game last weekend. He was pushing hard for um, McGowan's to be freshman of the year. Um, Andy Katz on the broadcast. So, and, and I think, I think, yeah, I mean, he scored 20 plus in four straight games. Baz, what do you think? I'm going to read you something right out of the right out of Seamus McKnight's game notes here that kind of kind of makes a pretty good argument for him. Over Nebraska's last seven games, Bryce McGowan's is averaging 20.1 points a game, shooting 45 percent from the field, 38 percent from three point range. He's got four straight games, 20 points. He's, he led the team in rebounds and steals the other night. Like he's putting up Player of the Year type stats, Freshman of the Year type stats over these last seven games. And he is. I mean, and you can't argue that. Problem was, he wasn't doing that the first <laughs> first 14 games of the year, 15 games of the year. It took him some time to kind of adjust. You know, the, the talent, the raw skill is undeniable. And we saw that. Oh, I think, God, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's – but it, it took him some time to figure out that you, you've got to handle the physicality. You've got to handle the bumps and, the, and, all, and all that sort of stuff that comes with playing big boy basketball. And he started to do that, and he started to realize that a lot of nights he might be the best athlete on the floor. And, and – uh-huh. You know, there's there's something to that, no matter what your record is. When Nebraska takes the floor, they've probably got one of the best two to three players on the floor um, yeah. every night. And, yeah, that, that gives you a chance. I haven't seen a player as gifted offensively as, as Bryce McGowan's at Nebraska. I don't – I mean, like people say, since when? I, I don't know. I mean, you're, I go back to hopping – I mean, Rich King Hoppin was in the 80s. Um, now, he blew out his knee. He would have been a higher draft pick had he not blown out his knee. He blew out his knee in February of his junior year or senior year. Um, Hoppin was a back-to-the-basket center, so it's a hard comparison. Rich King was the 14th overall pick in the draft, so, you know, but he was 7-1. In terms of the offensive skilled talent, I, I'd be hard-pressed to fi- find a guy that I've seen yeah. at Nebraska. It's um, it's rare. Yeah, it is. Lou, Lou um, was a first round, late first round pick. Tyron, but hard comparison because um, Lou was a point guard. A different little players are. Yeah. Um, Strickland played ten years in the NBA, but it's not. A, he wasn't drafted. It's not a great comparison because he's not. A, he's he wasn't offensive, offensively gifted like Bryce. What I'm telling you is, I haven't. I don't know if I've seen anybody's offensively gifted as Bryce at Nebraska. Yeah. Which is, in Nebraska hasn't been that bad. I know everybody disparages the program, but they've gone through stretches where they were pretty good um, and had some, had some big time talent, but man, it's, he, he is a serious offensive t- talent. I mean, it's, serious. yeah, he's, it's, it's been really impressive to, to yeah. watch him kind of make this adjustment. And if, if he keeps shooting it like he has, look, 30, if you were going to tell me before the year that Bryce McGowan's is going to shoot 38% from three point range, yeah. I would have said, hell yeah, freshman of the year. And, and he's well, yeah. finally he's finally gotten to that point where he's done it now on a consistent basis for the last two, three weeks. Yeah, Parker always says, and he's right, he's good shooting threes, but he's best going downhill. When, when he's going downhill to the rim, boy, I mean, he's really creative, uses both hands really well, which is that, – that's the thing that I really like about him is he goes left really well, um, which that, that makes him just – uh, that much harder to defend. Shot eighteen perimeter. free throws against Rutgers. Like, yeah. like he shoots free throws. Shot really eighteen well. free other... throws in a Big Ten game. Like, yeah, that's impressive 80, for anybody. Eighty percent plus sure. free throw shooter. He, you can count on him at the line. Yeah. What were you going to say, Parker? Sorry about that. Well, just that, and it's it seems like, and I haven't watched every minute that that they've played this year or anything like that. But I just in watching what I have the last couple of weeks as he's sort of taken off here over the past couple of weeks, it just. His shot selection is not perfect, and any volume scorer, like anyone who's in the position he's in, like you're going to take some tough ones because you're being asked to carry the load. So 
not mm-hmm. asking for perfection from him, but it seems like he's gotten a lot better. And this is what, I mean, it happens. It takes, it takes time for young guys, but he's just, he keeps getting better at taking more and more of his shots in rhythm too. Like you see less, not none, but you see less of the three dribbles and crossover and step back and pull up. You know, he takes yes. some deep threes, but when he gets them off an offensive rebound or a swing or a kick out or whatever, like that's fine if he shoots it from four feet beyond the arc because he can do it. It, j- it just, it's tougher when you're trying to create off the dribble and that's the shot you end up with. So he just, as his shot selection, at least in a non, uh, you know, non-expert opinion has gotten better. I mean, the percentages have, have risen right along with it. Yeah, he gives him a shot. He gives him a shot every every night. He gave him a shot the other night against Michigan. And, and look, if he's going to give you a shot against Michigan, he's certainly going to give you a shot against Northwestern, Minnesota, Penn State, Maryland. And, and so oh, I think that's where it's yeah, at. He'll be hard. Yeah, hard to guard. I, now, I, I'm glad Parker said what he did because there has to be balance in the conversation. He has taken some bad shots down the stretch of games yeah. and hurt him. I mean, he hurt him took a tough Rutgers. one that went off the side of the backboard. Yeah, yeah. Rutgers, yeah. Rutgers took a tough one. Yeah. Yeah. Took it, took it right to the center and tried to go under him against Rutgers at a critical time. Bad shot. It was just a bad shot. Now, one of the only free throws he's missed this year was against, uh, was that NC State? Had NC State, win. the one that yeah. was halfway down and popped out, where yeah. if it goes yeah. in, they win that game. And was that, was that, that, was that McGowan's? Yeah, yeah, it was in the gosh, was first overtime or the second overtime, I forget, but he got fouled 90 feet from the basket <laughs> in a Nebraska down one. Man, cash the first. I mean, the second one was it was half. There's a great screenshot of it out there. The ball was halfway down the cylinder, and it popped. Yeah, it won the game. Yeah, it would have won the game, and maybe the whole season is different. <laughs> if that Butterfly yeah, effect. Goes. That's but, not the guy you're fouling late. I'll tell you. Yeah, that. exactly. No, no, so, no, no. Yeah, right. Yeah. So yeah, it's gonna be interesting to watch. Northwestern plays everybody close. Everybody. They've had one game this year, and their losses that's been decided by double digits. It's just an insane amount of close games that they've played. So this is no. This is no pushover that's coming in here tomorrow. It's probably going to be a close no. game. It's probably going to come down to the end. Early in the season, though, you felt like Nebraska, one of the things, and, you know, they're 0 and 11, so for what it's worth, but like early in the season when they played close games, you weren't exactly sure what they were going to do. But I think even though we talked, you know, even though you missed the one against Rutgers or whatever, like if it gets close, like, they got to get, they got to play through number five. Like, I mean, they got a guy. Yeah. They have a guy that can do it. And they will at this point, like they know, and he knows that that's his time, right? Like, okay. Now uh, that's interesting. You say that because if you watch the Rutgers game, Rutgers doubled him and they, they took him out of a a little bit. So it's a, it's a, it's a little dicey that way. They, you need somebody else there. Um, I I don't know if everybody can do that. Rutgers plays really good defense and they doubled him at, uh, two critical times. It was interesting, um, and so he's got to he's got to be ready for that too. If the double team comes to get it out of his hand, yeah. Listen, listen yeah. to Hubie Brown here. Listen, listen to ninety-seven year old Hubie Brown breaking <laughs> it. Down. Okay, okay. Hubie's not ninety-seven. I'm looking up Hubie Brown's age. I he's know he's not ancient 97. though. He he is he's he's way older than you think. Eighty-four. Hubie Brown is seventy-nine. 79. 88. Born in, yeah, 88 no. years old. No. Yeah. 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 Born in 1933. Holy God. Just a couple years be, after SIP. He's going to be 89 in September. Oh, my. He's held up really well. Yeah. Yes, he has. He seems like he's younger than I am. He looks younger than you. Thanks. Thank I'm you. just joking. Come on. All right, guys. Um should we get out of here on that note? That was a productive That was podcast. fun. Yeah. That was good. That was fun. Speaking of players yeah. who've, who've become go-tos, though, I mean, it's pretty impressive. Just a note, women's hoops has won their last four. Jazz Shelley, near triple-double last night, had the assists and rebounds. And yep. Just came up like four points shy. Had a couple threes go around and out late. But she they're fun to watch in part because she can really play. I mean, she, you know, she's doing – Yeah. She's they got a lot of all the – of all the local teams, they're the one you point to and say they're going to the NCAA tournament. I think Creighton might be a 10 seed or something right now in bracketology, but but the women are like an eight probably if you look at it. Yeah. Eight, eight seed. They can tight. do it. Yep. 
They're going to the NCAA well, tournament. When they when they play well, they can play with a lot of teams. They I watched I watched them take Michigan to the woodshed a couple of weeks ago in PBA. Michigan's no slouch. So yeah. Uh, yeah, you said Jack Shelley's been great. Alexis Markowski has really come on. Allison Widener from St. Francis has really come on. They're playing really good basketball. They've got a chance to, to do something special this year. So speaking of special, that's going to wrap up this special podcast with my special yes. friends, Parker and, and, and Steve. We'll talk to you guys next week. Until then, thanks for watching.